So we're excited to have everyone here today for our monthly MI3 and MIS meeting. Um, special welcome to anybody who's new with us today and welcome back to everyone who's come to past meetings. So um, as always, we want a really active chat. If you are not presenting or speaking, um, please remember to mute and we can go to the next slide. So our agenda is, um, again, we start with the AI portion of our meeting, and then we will go into our innovation portion of our meeting. We will follow with our social where we'll go into breakout rooms. Um, thank you, Janae. My name is Kama Casado, and I am one of the lead interns for this summer. So I had the pleasure of working specifically with our under 18 interns who joined us for the last 10 or so weeks learning about seven emerging areas in medicine, which they will present on some updates in those fields. They also had the opportunity to shadow some of our wonderful chalk physicians in clinic and see kind of what a day in the life is like in a physician and develop ideas on places that could really be improved in healthcare that they then took and wrote an abstract on detailing their innovation in order to improve healthcare delivery. So we are very proud of them and thrilled that they are here to present to you today. And I will hand it over to Caitlin to give us the upcoming events. Hi, I'm Caitlin Manichetti. I am also a lead intern for the MI3 program this summer and have the privilege of working with Candler and under 18s this summer. Um, some of the upcoming events for Chalk as a hospital is the PEDS 2040 conference, which is on September 22nd to 24th, and the MedTech Innovation Forum, which is October 27th to 29th, and you can get more information at the links provided on this slide. Hi everyone, my name is Kaden and I am a rising senior at El Dorado High School. And for the quote of the month today, when speaking on the effects of AI on child psychology, Terrence Mills, the CEO of AI.io, a data science and engineering company delivering AI solutions in healthcare, travel, and entertainment, he states, for every misstep that the information age has bestowed upon us, we double down our efforts. We learn how to do better. After all, humans fall short when it comes to being infallible. Hello, I'm Michelle Kim, a rising senior at Whitney High School, and I'll be presenting our book of the month, The Future is Faster Than You Think by Peter Diamandis and Stephen Kotler. Published on January 28, 2020, The Future is Faster Than You Think is a work that illustrates the ever-changing technological advancements of our time as they merge with one another. From AI, virtual reality, quantum computing, and to so many more diverse Advancements, this work consists of several thought-provoking experiments regarding the possible convergence of a multitude of technological innovations and how they could affect one's daily life in the future. As said, technology spans throughout healthcare, education, and even in the nooks and crannies of one's everyday life, this book encompasses the growth of an assortment of industries and people to elucidate the acceleration of innovative developments during our time. Definitely a noteworthy book worth looking at this month. Hello everyone, I'm Ebony Zavala. I'm a rising junior at San Juan Hills High School. This month's article is Artificial Pancreases Were a Breakthrough for Type 1 Diabetes. The research type 2 is just beginning. A team of researchers has published research explaining how a closed-loop insulin delivery system could potentially help patients manage their disease at home. The artificial pancreas works by pairing a glucose sensor with an insulin pump to automatically adjust doses of the drug. The device improves the target glucose range by about 15% and also provides patients reaching avoids patients reaching a severe low glucose. This device has also helped patients who receive many injections Patients have said this device has made things much easier by reducing the amount of diabetes-related tasks. No need for injecting insulin manually, and an efficient algorithm calculates insulin doses. As researchers continue to investigate, it has brought to attention that this device can help many lives. Hi, my name is Ayushi Kudakia, and I'm a rising junior at Northwood High School. 
and I'll be presenting on the video of the month. So recently, the University of California, Davis, named the recipients of the 2021 Chancellor's Innovation Awards. These awards recognize faculty, project teams, and community partners for their work in improving the lives of other and addressing the needs of our global society through innovative solutions. The winner, Dr. David Olson's research, focuses on harnessing neuroplasticity to treat neuropsychiatric and neurodegenerative diseases like depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, addiction, and Alzheimer's disease. This work led Dr. Olson to co-found Delix Therapeutics, a company dedicated to using neuroplasticity promoting small molecules to treat a variety of brain disorders. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Eugenie Chang and I'm a rising junior at Northwood High School. So the person of the month for August is Michelle Hua, an innovator and rhythmic gymnast from Michigan. She was the first female in over a decade to win first place at the annual Regeneron ISEF competition for her creation of an algorithm and app that uses deep learning to analyze human movement. In an interview at the end of July, she revealed that her app was inspired by the difficulties she faced while training in rhythmic gymnastics during COVID-19, and she wanted to create an algorithm that could correct her form and prevent injuries from occurring during practice. The algorithm layers real-time human silhouettes over the user in a red outline and analyzes these silhouettes to recognize the action being performed. The app can then provide real-time feedback based on the user's performance. She hopes that this algorithm can be expanded to cover a larger variety of sports in the future to help more athletes with their training. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Kathleen Nguyen and I will be an upcoming senior at Westminster High School in Central Orange County and I have the pleasure of presenting the Organization of the Month Project Vietnam, which initially started out as a global program of the American Academy of Pediatrics and then branched off, separated to be a nonprofit organization changing lives through healthcare for the impoverished people of Vietnam. The current ongoing programs consist of those three bullet points through providing medical mission trips, training such as CPR and summer service camps, as seen in the photos on the right. And in accordance or in affiliation to Chalk, though, both are partners in de helping deliver awareness and education of autism and for children with special needs. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Emily Freitas, and I am a junior at Capistrano Valley High School. And today I'll be sharing the Journal of the Month. More than 250,000 women and 2,000 men in the United States receive a diagnosis of breast cancer every year. And 75% of patients with breast cancer have a type of cancer called estrogen receptor positive. This means that cancer cells has a receptor in their membranes that bind to the sex hormone estrogen, causing this cancer to be incurable as it spreads. Scientists from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign developed a drug candidate called ERSO that killed primary breast tumors along with secondary or metastasis cancer in a study in mice. This drug works by overactivating a stress response mechanism called, it, called unfolded protein response that typically protects cancer cells from harm to instead kill the estrogen receptor positive cancer cells. In mice with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer cells, the drug quickly killed 95 to 100% of primary cancer cells and their metastases in the brain, liver, lungs, and bones. This is valuable as tumors that spread to other sites in the body are responsible for most breast cancer deaths. Additionally, the drug selectively kills only cancer cells and does not touch healthy cells and cells that lack the estrogen receptor. Researchers are exploring using ERSO against other estrogen receptor positive cancers. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sam and I'm an incoming senior at CVHS and I'll be presenting a general news slide. The NIH is expanding biomedical research in the cloud with a partnership with Microsoft Azure. This is the latest move by the NIH and Stride's initiative to expand the availability of 43 petabytes of sequencing data, which they have collected, and to allow the use of complex computational research tools. By partnering with Microsoft Azure, the NIH will be able to put their data in the cloud, thus allowing access to this data to be opened up for more researchers than ever.
and in increasing the ease of use of this gargantuan data set. Microsoft Azure is a public cloud computing platform that can be used for virtual computing, storage, and analytics. So pairing this with the NIH's data seems to be a perfect match. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Reha Matai and I'm a rising senior at the Coraline High School. Hi, my name is Isabella Poppin and I am a rising senior at San, Clem at San Juan Hills High School. So today we're gonna to be talking about innovations in genomic medicine and its applications for cancer patients. In a study at St. Jude's, um, about 306 patients were offered whole genome and whole exome sequencing of germline DNA. And of those whole genome, whole exome, and RNA sequencing of tumor DNA were carried out in 253 patients. And according to the data, about 86% of the patients were found to have at least one cl clinically significant variation in the tumor or germline DNA. And this included variations associated with diagnosis, prognosis, therapy, or cancer predisposition. Now I'm going to pass it over to Isabella. As a result, researchers estimated that one in five patients had clinically relevant mutations that would have gone unnoticed using typical sequencing methods. The study showed the feasibility of identifying tumor vulnerabilities and learning to exploit them to improve patient care and provide promise for comprehensive genomic sequencing of all pediatric cancer patients is achievable and, ess and essential in the development of precision medicine. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Jeet Parikh and I'm an incoming sophomore at Northwood High School. I will be presenting on bioprinting and regenerative medicine. My partner Ryan Fway was unable to make today's meeting. Next slide. Cardiovascular diseases account for 32% of global deaths. These diseases such as myocardial infarctions can cause significant damage to cardiac tissue with, with the blood supply being decreased or stopped. After heart, attacks, after heart attacks, the heart recovers by forming scar tissue, which can have adverse effects like obstructing the electrical signals of a pumping heart. Researchers from the Pohang University of Science and Technology in South Korea have published an article discussing a 3D printed, 3D bioprinted cardiac patch with both therapeutic and regenerative properties. Since, since heart attacks damage both cardiac and vascular tissue, the researchers decided to use two different bioinks. One bioink contains cardiac progenitor cells, which are special stem cells that differentiate into cardiomyocytes, or heart cells. The second bioink is composed of mesenchymal stem cells, which have the ability to differentiate in, into many different types of cells. In this case, they will be primed to develop into vascular tissue. Using this 3D bioprinted strategy, the cardiac patch would synergistically improve vascularization and cardiac fun function. Finally, by using stem cells, they hope to decrease and possibly even reverse scar cardiac scar tissue. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Kaylin Chung and I'm a rising senior at Beckman High School. Hi everyone, my name is Tia Ketson and I'm a rising junior at Cypress High. Next slide, please. Today, we will be presenting about a nano patch that allows for the diagnosis of tuberculosis. TB is a contagious, life-threatening bacterial lung infection that causes 1.4 million deaths a year. Many existing tests are slow, have low sensitivity and specificity, and are too costly, especially in areas where resources are limited. Thus, to fulfill the need for efficient and cost-effective TB diagnostic methods, the Technion Israel Institute of Technology has created a nanosensor-stimulated patch that gives a TB diagnosis within one hour. Volatile organic compounds are emitted from our body and indicate our metabolic state. Because of this, the nanosensors located in the patch are able to detect these changes in toluene that relate to symptoms of TB. Increased levels of tol toluene emissions were present in cases of active TB. The patch utilizes the air trapped above the skin in order to obtain these positive or negative results. Now I will pass it on to Kaylin. The study design for the patch integrates multiple aspects of testing. Firstly, scientists found that the sampling at the anterior arm area gave the best and most stable results. Secondly, gas chromatography mass spectrometry analysis was used to analyze skin VOCs. GCMS identifies different substances in the test sample and allows for detection of increased toluene levels, which are found in active TB patients.
When evaluating the VOC pattern, selectivity was achieved by predictive measures based on machine learning. The main advantages of the patch lies in its simplicity and usability beyond areas where good infrastructure is a guarantee. This nano sticker format is projected to diagnose other diseases, which will reduce the number of missed cases for a variety of conditions. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vikram Chatterjee, and I'm an incoming freshman at Claremont McKenna College. And my name is Shakti Ramakrishna, and I'm an incoming junior at Plano East Senior High School, and we will be presenting about innovative medical devices. So the first device we're talking about today is a fully implantable pacemaker made of bioresorbable components. So for some background and an overview of this innovation, researchers at Northwestern and George Washington Universities developed this innovation together. And some of its main qualities include being wireless, battery-free, and fully implantable. Not only that, but it disappears when it's no longer needed. And that is primarily due to the materials and composition of this. It is made of silicone, which by itself is water soluble, water soluble and has a slow rate of dissolution. The researchers at Northwestern and George Washington used very thin silicone, but still enough to build transistors and other functional electrical, electrical components. So this transient pacemaker prevents the risks of infection, dislodgement, torn or damaged tissues, bleeding, and blood clots. It's light and thin, weighs less than half a gram, and is only 250 microns thick. And the soft and flexible nature of the pacemaker contains electrodes that softly laminate onto the heart surface to deliver an electrical pulse instead of using traditional wires. In a study published on June 28th in Nature Biotechnology, researchers demonstrated the device's efficacy across a series of large and small animal models. They cited several critical needs for an alternative temporary pacemaker technology that can deliver the needed electrotherapy while still addressing the associated physiological complications. So to present some future development, the development of bioresorbable materials makes it more possible to create more diagnostic and therapeutic transient devices for monitoring progression of diseases and therapies, delivering electrical and pharmacological treatments, cellular therapies, and gene reprogramming, and more. Thank you. So the second medical innovation we will be talking about is a biosense, biosensor for use during surgery. So researchers at Purdue University have created a biosensor that records and images tissues and organs during surgery. It can be 3D printed and it is made of biolinks which are softer than body tissue that can also stretch without disturbing sensor function and can stick to tissue surfaces without needing adhesives. This biosensor can adhere with curved surfaces even under mechanical deformations. And because the biosensor can interface with these curved surfaces, it allows for recording and imaging of the area. The researchers have been able to create these biosensors in various different shapes and sizes, and the biosensors don't have an effect on cardiac function and are biocompatible and anti-biofouling. They have been used to identify the exact location of issues such as arrhythmias due to myocardial infarction, which can be useful for guiding surgeries, especially when a border for surgery needs to be established. And the researchers are working on applying this to different tissues and organs aside from the heart. Hello. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm, a, I'm Akash Patel, a rising junior at Troy High School. Hello, everybody. My name is Anisha Singh, and I'm a rising senior at Samueli Academy. Today, we will be presenting the vicarious surgical robot, which was inspired by the science fiction film Fantastic Voyage. The robot has two arms, each with 28 sensors and a single camera. It is designed to enter the patient's body through an incision site of less than one inch and operate in all directions once inside. The robot is to be operated through a VR headset and was created in the hopes of making abdominal surgeries faster and safer while still being easy to use for physicians. The robot has the ability to put the elbows of the robotic arms down inside the body cavity and reach towards the abdominal wall. The vicarious robot's expected price of 1.2 million roughly half that of, is roughly half that of existing top-line robots. Hernia repair is the first target market, which has more than 2 million procedures a year in the U.S., but the surgery results in recurrence of about 30% of the time, often requiring a more extensive fix. The new vicarious robot could perform the surgery in a cadaver in about half the time 
and it has since cut that to under one hour. This shorter surgery is less risky for patients and more cost-effective for hospitals. Thank you. Hello, we'll be presenting on innovations in healthcare and delivery. I'm Sophia Harvey. I'll be a rising junior at Rosary Academy in Fullerton. And my name is Taylor Zielenbach, and I'm going to be a junior at San Juan Hills High School. So for our presentation, we focused on the distribution of the COVID-19 vaccine, just as it is very relevant in our world today. Um, and I'm going to be presenting about COVAX. So COVAX is the vaccine's pillar of the access to COVID-19 tools accelerator that was founded in April, 2021. COVAX is co-led by the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, and the World Health Organization. They are working on equitable access to the COVID-19 vaccine around the globe because no one is safe until everyone is safe. The more vaccines that are distributed around the world, the safer everyone will be. It has become common for wealthier countries to gain greater access to vaccines. So COVAX is trying to put an end to this theme and, accel and accelerate the output of vaccines, regardless of a country's wealth or status. COVAX offers the delivery of vaccines as soon as more are available, a diverse and accurate set of vaccines, the chance to rebuild economies, and doses for at least 20% of countries' populations. Also, in June 2021, the Launch and Scale Speedometer, led by the Duke Global Health Innovation Center, published an open letter to world leaders at the G7 Summit with the proposed five-point plan to quickly and equitably distribute vaccines to the world. The letter was endorsed and signed by 21 global health leaders, as well as the Center for Global Development, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, COVID Collaborative, COVID Collaborative, and the Duke Global Health Institute. The five points of the plan include the establishment of a G7 vaccine emergency task force, the development and commitment to a path to share at a minimum 1 billion doses of authorized vaccines before the end of 2021, the implementation of a coordinated G7 strategy to increase production of high quality and well-regulated vaccines, accelerated development of high quality globally distributed manufacturing capacity by bringing together public and private sector stakeholders, and increased bilateral and multilateral technical and financial support to low and middle income countries to enhance their vaccine distribution capabilities and address vaccine hesitancy. The health experts said the G7 members are on a path to contain the pandemic in their respective countries and to meet the moment, must work to ensure the fastest possible path to access billions of doses of high quality vaccines and ensure local capacity to deliver them, complementing ongoing multinational efforts. Thank you. All right, thank you interns. Um, David, can we go back a couple slides actually, please? Two slides, thank you. Um, we actually have a couple minutes. So I'm just gonna hang out and see if there are any questions. I actually do see one question currently in the chat from Dr. Bob Hoyt. He asks, what powers the temporary pacemaker intrinsic to the device or from a device on the chest wall? Um, so if our interns who were addressed that topic could go ahead and answer that. I'm not sure if they know the answer. I can try someone. Oh, go ahead. Right. No, go ahead, Vikram. Yeah. Take a shot yeah. at it. Okay, yeah. Um, based on my reading of this research, uh, the, it doesn't have an externalized power supply from another device like maybe traditional um, pacemakers do. I believe this is built into the device itself, but I think the the key like components of that device are are not known to me. So I apologize for that. Uh, so there's a couple different bio batteries that are kind of coming to fruition. So there's several that work on um, kind of like sugar containing um, solutions. Um, and so they're basically sugar power batteries. And those are, I, I think, making a lot of progress recently. Um, there's also um, a number of bio batteries that are using kinetic energy to be charged. So um, I think, my, if I remember correctly from reading that, Essentially, what it does is that as the heart beats, it stores energy within a capacitor from the kinetic energy from the heart and then uses that so that if the heart stops, it sort of has this, um, uh, you know, a, a charged uh, capacitor that it can release to then uh, jolt the, the body back in, or the heart back into rhythm. Is that, Vikram looks like he was Googling. Is that, did I, did I tell the truth? 
Yeah, um, I think you covered, you know, the the main the main principles. I Shakti helped me do some research right now, um, and what it says in the article is that it wirelessly harvests energy from an external remote antenna using near field communication protocols, the same ones used in smartphones for electrical payments and in RFID tags. So yeah, it doesn't have any bulky so batteries. Or, it is externally powered, but wireless. Yeah, my bad. I apologize for that. Um, oh, that's interesting. So, but yeah, but it eliminates the need for kind of like bulky batteries or, or rigid hardware. So it still has that kind of minimalist design that we talked about in the beginning. I have seen ones though with the kinetic energy stuff, Bob, which I think is interesting. I wonder, um, you know, how how that works in terms of getting recharged, um, you know, wirelessly charging, but especially with heat, I think heat has been one of the issues. Um, so if you know, like with the most recent iOS update, uh, the Apples will have uh, Apple um, phones will have regenerative charging or reverse charging. So you could put like your AirPods on the back of your iPhone and charge the case. But the problem is it generates lots of heat. It also would require thoracotomy to implant it, right? Yeah, I think this would still require, but it's uh, some some kind of, or I don't know. We should probably ask the cardiologist. <laughs> what, Anthony, do you know? Um, thoracotomy, I mean, you can have you can have a mini thoracotomy almost non-invasively with some of the small batteries now. So it's not, not almost an outpatient procedure. All right, is there any other questions before we move on? Okay, I do see one. Oh, this is just a comment. Joseph Morgan says a lot of advances in material science recently, thermodynamics and piezo piezoelectrics in particular ultimately depends on power draw. All right. Now, if that's it for questions, we can go ahead and move on to our medical innovation guest speaker. Deborah, would you like to go ahead and introduce him? Absolutely happy to. I have the privilege of introducing Mats Johansson today. He's the president of Eon Reality. They are a leader in XR and particularly in the, in the area of education. Um, Eon is a really fast moving, always pushing the envelope company. They are very collaborative and we have the privilege of collaborating and working closely with them in MI3 and at Chalk. So Mats, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Deborah, and uh, thanks for having me. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about XR and medicine today and tomorrow. And uh, I've been in this space personally for the last 25 years. And I can say there's uh, never been an as exciting time to be an XR as today. Uh, we have a lot of users, a lot of devices, uh, a lot of innovation going on. So let's go to the next slide, please. I thought I would start a little bit with some numbers just to kind of uh, uh, show where we are today. <clears throat> and I'll start with VR. Compound sales in VR was five and a half million units uh, last year, projected to be about 6.6 .6 million in 2021. So healthy growth. Uh, there's a cumulative install base of about 16 plus million headsets. This of course excludes uh, things like using a mobile device uh, with a VR viewer, but these are uh, devices used in gaming and media entertainment. You see it's roughly 50%. But number three is healthcare. And uh, ahead of areas like manufacturing, tele, uh, telecommunications, education, et cetera. Next slide, please. And this was a little tidbit uh, that I found looking at uh, healthcare. And we can see from our perspective with Eon that, that healthcare use is growing. Uh, this was from end of last year. Uh, and uh, a good percentage, uh, a little bit shy of 20%, I guess, we're expanding VR programs, about a quarter piloting, and uh, the rest either evaluating or exploring VR use cases. Uh, so we've seen, I think if we went back a few years, this would be, uh, you know, five years, for instance, that would be a very small percentage, very R&D oriented, and we see much broader use now. Next slide, please. 
Now, AR is a different ballgame. If you remember, we had 16 and a half million VR devices. Uh, if we look at AR kit, which is Apple's uh, AR solution, uh, it's a little bit shy of 1.2 billion devices. And then if you look at Google, it's about 600 plus uh, billion. And then we have, uh, uh, if you remove duplicates there, uh, you have about 600 billion uh, devices. Uh, and uh, uh, it's interesting to see active users, especially on the Apple side, it's, it's close to a billion. So these are people that log in and use AR solutions ongoing. Next slide. Uh, this is a study that we've uh, used for a little while looking at uh, memory encoding increase uh, and these subjects were exposed to AR and uh, AR delivered about almost two times the level of visual attention compared to non-AR and they found that memory encoding was 70% higher. I'll talk a little bit towards the end about various benefits that you can find but this is an interesting one. And by the way, if you're interested to have any of the uh, studies, et cetera, that I, I uh, reference here, we're happy to share. Next slide. Okay, so um, E.ON has been on this 20 year journey towards what we call XR democratization. And if we look at our use, and of course, like, like Deborah mentioned, we're primarily in education, and that means primarily in higher education, either universities, or technical vocational education. Uh, we know that 99% of our users use a mobile device, a tablet or desktop. Uh, so even though the VR uh, type devices or, or wearable AR, which I didn't talk about before, are growing, it's still a small portion. So it's really the mobile, uh, mobile game. And we've seen quite a bit of increase across the boards. So and if we take the next slide, please. This is maybe the most interesting ones. Uh, so during 2021, we have surpassed 20,000 applications on our platform. So these are applications for different learning use cases, training, education, et cetera. Next slide. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the future. Uh, metaverse, uh, some of you who watch the news might have seen and, or heard this terminology uh, being used. And uh, uh, a lot of the large tech companies uh, like Facebook or Oculus are talking about this. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, and what it means is that it's a VR AR space where users can interact with a computer generated environment and other users. And if we go one more, we have the long version. So it basically is a collective virtual shared space created by convergence of virtual enhanced physical reality or physically persistent virtual space, including the sum of virtual worlds, augmented reality and the internet. So this is a mouthful. Uh, I'm gonna show you some of our uh, views on metaverse and how it can uh, benefit knowledge transfer. So let's go to the next slide. One is merged XR and we can go to the next slide. And this is basically adding kind of a digital twin to your education experience or your, your training experience. Let's go to the next. Or spatial meetings. And uh, we've seen this around the, the VR, AR space for quite a while, but uh, with the use of mobile devices, this is becoming more and more persistent. And we think that'll be a big uh, use case. So let's go to the next slide. So this shows a little kind of artist view on how that could be. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about practically what's possible today. And I thought I would show a couple of videos here. We can go to the next one. So the first one is uh, what we're doing today from physical to digital. And this is uh, where, where I reference, we have about 20,000 different applications. So let's go to the next slide. So this shows a little learning experience that uh, someone put together uh, on our platform. It's obviously some kind of lab environment. Uh, they created some uh, uh, text annotations. There's a voice over here. We, we turned it off now for the presentation. 
Uh, you can also very quickly move this into an AR type environment. Uh, here they chose to put it outside. So you can kind of mix uh, the real and, and the, the virtual world. Let's go to the next slide because now we'll talk about the future a little bit. So one big use case that we see in uh, uh, kind of the, the metaverse uh, reference is what we refer to as merged XR where you have this digitally enhanced reality. And let's go to the next slide. There's gonna be a little video here. This shows an iPhone 12, where actually the user here is scanning a uh, real environment. So we see there's a, uh, some antlers on the wall there, there's some paintings. And uh, iPhone has this LiDAR scanning camera built in. So here's the, the 3D model from that scan. And you can see it's not perfect, but it's, uh, it's something that used to be very uh, costly, uh, very uh, you know, specialized, expensive equipment to use normally. Now, what we're gonna do with this is that we're gonna connect this with the real world. And if you have three reference points in a model, you can align it perfectly. Uh, if you remember from your math lessons. So now we're seeing here the real world again through a video. And underlying this is this scan model where we can add annotations and enhance the real world. Uh, so this can be used in many, many different types of situations, uh, learning, uh, field technicians. I'm sure there will be a ton of interesting use cases in healthcare as well. And all you need is a, a mobile device to do this, uh, which we talked about in the beginning. There's about a billion plus uh, of these. Next slide, please. And then uh, we're also working on spatial meetings. Uh, we've had this ability to do distributed lessons with voice and, and uh, kind of basic representations in the NXR. And if we go to the next slide. So here you'll see a little bit uh, what we see coming. This is uh, one of our artists put this together. Uh, we are going to support this fully on mobile devices. Uh, there's a lot of desktop based or, or VR headset based solutions, but relatively few on the, on the mobile or tablets. Uh, so we think that's gonna be something quite beneficial. Uh, and you'll be able to customize uh, your avatars, uh, and have this kind of virtual collaborative experience uh, in, a, in a spatial environment. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Let me talk a little bit about some use cases. Uh, some of you know Eon and, and some of you are probably new to us. Uh, so for those of you who know us, you might recognize some of these, but let's go to the next. This is one of my favorite uses in medicine. Uh, this is a project that's uh, run over many years and we've collaborated with Loyola University of Chicago and with the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And this shows a little bit uh, kind of uh, what the application entails, but it's basically a simulator where you can simulate different pupil dysfunctions uh, in a patient and uh, then you can practice recognizing these or, or taking the, the correct kind of uh, uh, actions. Let's go to the next slide. And University of Nebraska, and actually let's forward to the next slide. And again, happy to share uh, these studies. Uh, but they did a study on this a few years ago, and this was actually on a, uh, a kind of VR simulator, a little bit specialized device, hardware. And uh, they had about 145 students, uh, primarily first year students, but also some uh, residents. And uh, we can see here that uh, pre-training, about 97% of the students uh, were not comfortable uh, doing a pupillary exam. And we got the mirror image afterwards. Interesting enough, if you looked at the residents, even though it was a smaller group uh, that were studied, it was about 50-50 before and then significantly higher afterwards. 
So a uh, really interesting reference study for VR. And if we go to the next slide, uh, we've now taken this whole program, which was a, uh, as I mentioned, kind of tied to high-end expensive VR simulator, uh, not like a flight simulator, but uh, a little bit similar. Uh, we've taken this now to the platform. So now you can use this on a mobile device and uh, University of Nebraska, they did a, uh, the first delivery of this program with hundred plus students in, uh, in May and uh, everything worked really well. Uh, again, uh, happy to share these videos if you want to see more, but let's go to the next slide. We have some time for Q&A. This is an interesting one. This is a big university in Europe. They implemented uh, XR throughout 20 different programs, so pretty diverse. And uh, when the pandemic hit in April last year, they decided to go full in. They went from about uh, 1,700 to 16,500 users, but maybe most interestingly, they created over 1,500 applications that they use in their programs and uh, the other people can access uh, uh, through our platform. So we've seen this, uh, especially the last couple of years and, and through the pandemic, we've seen a, a much larger adoption of XR in learning. Next slide, please. And here are a few more. Again, we're, we're happy to share. There's a lot of local ones as well, or, or US-based, as you can see here. Uh, so if you're interested, let us know, and we'll be happy to share. Uh, let's go to the next one. Perfect. Uh, there's a lot of good studies out there, and uh, the, the numbers to the right there uh, are from a Price Waterhouse Cooper study. And uh, the first benefit that I would like to, to emphasize is obviously that you have a learning benefit. Uh, according to Price Water, learners uh, uh, were four times faster to train in XR than in the classroom. They were more confident. Uh, you saw the Nebraska study in medicine. Maybe it wasn't quite 275%, but it was significant improvement. And you have other benefits as well. Uh, there's a lot of good studies out there, but that's one that I think is pretty relevant. And if we go to the next one, uh, there's also the uh, financial benefit. So this is a study from a large uh, manufacturing company, uh, Atlas Copco is a European company, and they looked at service technicians and operators and, and service technicians, the use case was primarily AR. And they felt they could save plus 90%. And if you think about this big number, one of the main reasons is that they uh, will be able to deliver this in an AR modality versus uh, physical training centers. Uh, this doesn't happen overnight, but uh, it's something that uh, as we move along, we'll have a lot of benefits in, in multiple fields. Uh, next slide, please. And then the third type of benefit I would say that's important besides learning benefits, financial benefits is productivity. And uh, this was a pretty big study by Harvard Business Review. Uh, they looked at a, a GE equipment. I can't remember exactly what type of equipment it was, but uh, for a, a senior technician, first time use, uh, accessing information in AR provided a 34% increase in productivity. So I think with that, that concludes my presentation. And uh, I guess we have a little bit of time for Q&A. We did have some discussion going on in the chat, Matt, with regards to nausea. And I know this is one of the things that always comes up with XR. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, that, that's one reason why I showed this also, that if you look at headsets, uh, there are limitations for how long we should and could use them. And actually one, one big factor is age. Uh, children have a lot easier to adopt to longer use time, which could be interesting uh, for your case. And there's been some studies around that. But the, if you look at the numbers, we had the 16 million headsets. Uh, we have uh, uh, in, in compound 1.8 billion AR devices. And you typically don't see 
emotion sickness issues scenarios in AR as much. And that's uh, where the big use case currently is going. As you go to AR headsets and VR headsets, you have to be conscious. Um, you know, uh, it's not something you can use for hours and hours, uh, but we've also seen in gaming and uh, with the providers like Oculus that the, uh, the use time goes up as you have fun. So the, I think there's something to learn there as well. Uh, we're more on the application software side, so I would look at what some of the larger manufacturers say and do and what their recommendations are. We definitely have some interest, um, particularly from the chalk team, with regards to um, working in, in AI and, and integrating AI into some of these modules. Absolutely. It's something we're very uh, interested in as well and, and passionate about. Uh, of course, one of the, the key fundamentals is access to large uh, data volumes to be able to use it effectively. And uh, as we know, there, there are and, and could be some challenges there. But from EON's side, one thing that we've done uh, is that we focused on the, on the content development side and use AI to help develop the applications or the learning experiences more quickly. Uh, so we've used things like uh, uh, SERP uh, and uh, image recognition like Google Lens, etc. Uh, and then we're also uh, starting to look at uh, ways to automate uh, creation where you have a, a lot of uh, information, let's say like a, a user manual, for instance, for some complex machinery to deploy AI there to kind of aid the, the content development process. That's a, the primary focus, but I, I'd love to um, get into more use cases. And I know we have a dialogue about this exactly what to do. I think there's a lot of benefits uh, blending the two. Well, I know we've taken a lot of, of the, the um, 3D assets on the platform uh, and and played with them and worked really closely with your team to animate a lot of them and to, um, and our clinical teams just keep dreaming up more modules to work on with Eon. I'm really excited about our MRI module that'll be coming up that helps kids with anxiety um, as they're um, preparing to undergo their um, MRI procedure. And then um, working with our cardiology team to create some modules to educate parents on some various um, heart conditions. It'd be amazing to get some of our interns involved too in, in working on some of these modules. So I know some of the tactile questions um, with tactile and, and how, and I know every month um, XR is, is advancing and becoming more sophisticated and where are we with, with tactile? Um, and, and how soon do you think we'll have even more breakthroughs? Yeah, um, it's one of the maybe toughest areas to uh, uh, at least deploy in volume. Uh, there are devices that are quite accurate uh, and, and the experience is good, but they're very, very expensive. Uh, so it, it's kind of prevented, uh, you know, larger deployment of tactile. Actually, with the um, pupil simulator, we used a, a simple form of tactile uh, with a, a stylus that you could hold in your hand, similar to how you hold a light that you shine mm -hmm. in the patient's eye. And with that, you could have a little kind of vibration feedback as you touch something. So I think... Uh, if you want to do things like surgery, it's going to be highly specialized, uh, expensive equipment, but there are simple things you can do that are quite good with a motion controller and, and VR, for instance. Uh, if you bump into something, you can kind of create a little bit of a reaction there in the consumer device. I think that's where we are. Uh, obviously, things will improve over time and, and uh, new devices will come that does tactile better, but I would say it's, it's one of the areas of VR that's kind of still in its infancy. 
I know we had a question. Um, do you have to wear a whole body suit with sensors to get the tactile feel? Yeah, I mean, believe it or not, there are uh, companies. Uh, there was actually a company at CS that won one of their top innovation awards for a full uh, suit. Uh, it's a little bit like a, a, a wetsuit that you don. And, but the experience is amazing. You can get tactile, you can get uh, hot, cold, uh, and it's uh, incredibly accurate, uh, but it's still, uh, still in its infancy. Uh, the, the name escapes me for the moment. I'll, I'll share it uh, afterwards if someone is interested. Um, but that's one that we've tried out. That's quite good, but it's still, you know, in, in the order of tens of thousands of dollars, uh, which is typically prohibitive for volume deployment. Uh, I think there is a lot you can do without uh, tactile or, or, or those types of uh, environments. Uh, uh, if you think about how you approach it and the key is to capture uh, volume or, or be able to do it on a mobile device. That, that's our thinking at least. I think one of the biggest challenges too is, is from the clinician side, it's looking at what problems are we trying to solve? And then working with our partners like Eon, is this the best way to solve that problem? What else have you tried? And, and is this the most effective way? And, um, that I think is has been our biggest learning is being able to bridge that, which really that's where that collaborative um, aspect comes in. And you guys are really collaborative in working with us. Um, I think the other piece, you guys deliberately um, did not make it required that everyone has to put on an Oculus or Magic Leap headset, right? So being able to have a QR code and take these modules with you on your cell phone, on your iPad, on your laptop, that was, that was something very deliberate that you guys did. Absolutely. And I think uh, one of your presenters, I think it was Neil in the beginning, Harry talked about, you know, connecting technical teams and, and other specialist teams. Uh, that's when we've seen you get really good outcomes, like the pupil simulator reference that I, I used here. We had a, uh, a physician working very closely with our 3D artists and our programmers. And, and uh, that's when you get this, this mind share and we can create something really wonderful. And I think that, that's what we're doing together as well, so. It really is that, that connectivity. And it's not just we take curriculum and hand it to you and then you create something. It's, it's that iterative process that makes this successful. Any other questions? So we are gonna go ahead and if people do have questions, for Matt's, hopefully Matt's, you can stay on and host a breakout room. Um, we will have um, our breakout rooms ready to go and um, we will jump into those right now. So hopefully everyone can stay on and everyone can jump into a breakout room. So again, congratulations to all of our interns. Really um, amazing presentation. Thank you to our presenters today. Um, and thank you for everybody who, who joined us. You know, we love having people like Jonathan who come regularly and then brand new people who have never come before. And it, it's always a really good mix. And um, it's really appreciated. I know every, week, every month I learn more and more about AI. And um, hopefully we're, we're bringing um, good presentations that both balance the, the AI and the innovation aspects of it and keep people thinking and keep people wanting to come back. So um, we hope to see everyone next month. Thanks everyone. Bye.